You see them there talking about those red flags. And by the way, uh, in terms of Charles Vallow, who is uh, Lori Vallow Daybell's uh, former husband, uh, she has been separately charged in Arizona with conspiracy to commit his murder. We know that her now deceased brother, Alex Cox, killed Charles Vallow in what was originally believed to be self-defense. But clearly, it seems there's more to that. Um, when you were speaking with the grandparents, they, they kind of gave you an insight about what we were all seeing from the outside. Where were these children and how it developed that this went from, you know, something's a little off to we don't know. They're, they're, they disappeared and then ultimately their bodies were found. You know, people might be joining this trial for the first time um, and hearing this, Gigi. What do you say to them to understand how big it is and monumental that we are at a trial right now, considering the fact that at, there was a point in time how this developed? It was such a mystery. It was a mystery, and there were a lot of missed signs very early on before the kids went missing that uh, could, could have potentially prevented where we are today. But, you know, after Charles' murder, the, the communication with J.J. essentially dropped off. And the few times that she did see him, it was clear to her he wasn't medicated. Uh, he what, no, Lori's a hairdresser, so normally his hair was always perfect. She said that last call, actually his hair was very messy. It looked coached. And so I think in some ways, maybe that's a little bit of vindictiveness on Lori's part. Because remember, Charles, before Alex Cox, Lori's brother, murdered him, uh, he signed his life insurance policy over to Kay. So I do think some of this keeping J.J. away from the grandparents might have just been vindictive out of her anger for not getting that million dollar life insurance policy. Well, look, you know, allegedly murdered him. You know, we still are. That's still a pending case about what's going to happen. Right. Um, I do want to ask you uh, as we're, we're seeing this and trying to understand a little bit more about where there, this is going, how this is going to unfold. Larry and Kay Woodcock. Is it, are they potentially witnesses in this case? Because I know that became an issue in terms of whether or not they can even be in that courtroom during the course of this trial. Where are we? Where's the latest with that? Yeah, they both are on the witness list. And so we're awaiting that ruling, which we're hoping comes down today in defining what a victim is, according to George, Judge Boyce. So that's kind of what everybody is waiting on the most today is to see what that ruling will be, whether or not Kay and Larry, after they testify, can sit in as victims. Yeah. But it seems to be pretty divided among uh, legal analysts of what might could happen with that. I mean, it, it seems like it could go either way, and it would be very devastating if they're not allowed to sit in the, the trial for their grandson. I would be curious if they uh, testify and then they're not going to be called back as witnesses, would they then be allowed to sit in the galley? Um, so Kay Woodcock, you want to talk about heartbreaking. She also spoke with you, I understand, about, you know, there was a hope that they might find these kids alive. Um, and here's what she had to say. Yes. It was uh, in December of 2019. Um, I want to say it was early December. Um, a detective, our detective and uh, Chandler, look, I told him when all this started, look, don't, don't dilly-dally around. You tell me the truth. You be honest and, and upfront and don't candy coat it. Just be real. And, and so I was, and we're going to be real with you. We want you to be real with us. And so he called us one night in December and he said, he were talking about other things. And then he said, look, guys, I, I hate to be the one to tell y'all this, but they don't think the kids are alive, mm -hmm. but they don't know where they are. And anyway, we ended that call and we both just, it was the heart fell apart. It, yeah. was, it was horrific. And then after a few minutes, I said, no, no, no. We don't know that they're dead. And until I know there's a body, he's not dead. And I don't believe it. She's hiding him somewhere. She is that vindictive. She would, I, my biggest fear was that she would uh, get, since she was the only mother of uh, the only parent now, she could have given up her rights and let someone else adopt him, and I would have never, ever known where he was. Yeah. And that is what I thought the worst thing she could do to us 
with that. Gigi, one of the questions I always get asked about this is, is there any smoking gun in this case against Lori? And my response is, it's the alleged lies. It's the, it's the information that she chose not to come out with and why she seems so deceptive. But I am curious what a potential defense could be. Do you anticipate that this is going to be a situation where she's going to say, I was manipulated by Alex and Chad and put all of the blame on them? One, Chad's not in this trial with her. And two, Alex Cox is dead. Do you anticipate that is what the defense might be here? Yeah, I think that's their only option is to throw the dead guy and her husband, whose case is now severed from hers, under the bus. And I don't know. I mean, alibi-wise, she says she was in the townhomes at the time of both murders. But we also know some pretty big names and some close associates of Chad and Lori during this time will be testifying to debunk, essentially, that um, that alibi. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this transpires. It's, you know, we think we know the story, but I don't, I don't think we know the half of it yet of how this all went down. By the way, who was where and involved. By the way, why are you in Ada County? Let's make that clear as well. Uh, you know, suppose this is not where the crimes were committed. Yeah, there was a change of venue request by both sides. And so they moved it here to Ada, which is a, a huge city. And, um, Hopefully, you know, find find an unbiased jury here in a bigger population because it's so small down in Rexburg and in that area that, that everybody kind of knows everybody. And, of course, the, the media focus was there so, so uh, thick in the in the early days. And I think it, it was probably the right call to bring it up here because it's, it's just such a small community there. It's hard to find an impartial jury considering I feel like a lot of people know about this case from all parts of the country. Um, but this is also not a death penalty case. There was talk at one point with Lori Valadebel faced the death penalty, but it kind of, the reason that was the case, um, can you explain what was the justification for this now not being that? So there was some discovery that was turned over late by the state to the defense. It was due February 20, before February 27th, and they turned it in at the end of the business day on the 27th. It was a lot of discovery. It was 5,000 pages of documents, also 3,000 phone calls that Chad has made over the course of time to other people from inside the jail. And they simply didn't have time to go through this before today. Yeah. So in return, the judge took the death penalty off the table due to that discovery coming in late. All right, Gigi McKelvey, thank you so much. I know you have to get a seat inside the courthouse. And as I said, you are going to be our eyes and ears with no cameras. You're going to give us the latest about what you observe as this is day one of the Lori Vallow Daybell case and day one of jury selection. Gigi, thank you so much. Thanks, Jesse. All right, everybody. So we're going to continue, obviously, to follow the Lori Vallow Daybell trial as best as we can here on the network. And I'm going to be signing off for now. But in the meantime, here is the police interview with Melanie Gibb, who is a central figure in this case. We're going to go to a break first, and then you're going to see it on the other side. So Melanie Gibb is the former friend of Lori Vallow. This was an interview that was conducted back in April of 2021 with Rexburg, Idaho Police. We'll take a break, and you'll see that interview on the other side. Thanks, everybody.